Welcome to this week's Money Metals Podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the low cost precious metals dealer voted best in the U.S., Money Metals Exchange. It is my privilege now to welcome back David Smith, senior analyst at the Morgan Report and regular contributor to MoneyMetals.com. David, thanks for joining us again, and how are you? I'm just fine, Mike. It's great to be back. Well, David, not too long ago, you wrote an article for our site about how gold and silver were getting ready for an historic run, you called it. Uh, so before we start discussing some of the, the market action here recently, fill our listeners in on why you believe things were set up and are set up uh, for us to see a good run in the metals here. Well, we've had a very trying period since 2011 when a lot of people have been really worn out and, and, and torn out and, and uh, left the market because the prices have declined substantially in what is really a normal reaction in a very large bull market, what we call a uh, cyclical reaction within a secular bull market. And the prices, if you look at other uh, times in history where this has happened, the prices did not decline more than what you would expect, but it's pretty hard when you see uh, prices drop by 40 or 50 percent over five years. But last year kind of started to turn things around, and then we had a correction from that. And now we're building this very large sideways space which uh, all sorts of indicators are indicating that we're now ready to launch into the next part of the bull market, which will be, as David Morgan has always taught, it will be the most profitable part of the whole thing. And uh, we're looking at, at probably three to five years of advancing prices and maybe more in gold and silver as this thing gets underway. And so we're building this base, and uh, it's moved above 1,300 gold, as you know, last week and held there. And so uh, things are going to be going a very positive way for the bulls going forward here. So the metals have been showing some good signs of life here. Uh, we've got gold at its uh, high for the year. Silver is still lagging a bit and hasn't reached its high for the year yet. Now, I'm not sure if you're thinking the same thing, but, but things are feeling a little bit different this time in terms of the advance that we're seeing and the setup that you just alluded to. Uh, do you think silver will finally start outperforming, and, and how much of a run do you see in silver prices in the next, say, 6 to 12 months? Silver will at some point start outperforming, and it's a metal that kind of surprises people. They're looking at it now, and they say, well, why isn't it stronger in relationship to gold? And over time, there's about an 85% correlation. In other words, if gold is moving up, silver will too. But it doesn't do that on a daily basis or even a weekly basis. And what it kind of likes to do is to make people think it's going to stay weak for a long time, and then all of a sudden there's a price explosion, you know, and so... One of these days we'll wake up and silver will be up 75 cents on the day, and people go, well, where did that come from? When in reality, it was going on under the hood all along, and it was taking its time, and then all of a sudden they go going to the upside. So uh, these different things that are going on with big money moving in from hedge funds into the metal space and the uh, mining stocks being more strongly supported uh, and the incredible demand, which just keeps on growing and going from China and India, and now Turkey. Turkey's become the third largest importer of gold now in the world. All of these things augur very positively for, for the precious metals, and that doesn't even discuss the supply concerns that are, that are starting to accrue. I know it's been maybe a little bit difficult for a lot of the, the silver bulls out there to see it just kind of go sideways for all this all this time, these last four or five years now. But what is it, the saying that the bigger the base, the... The larger the base, the bigger the upside case. It's kind of an old trading truism. And, you know, the supply issue, the person on the street will say, well, wait a minute, I can still buy gold and silver at Money Metals at a, a pretty reasonable price. And that's true. But what's happening is the supply pipeline is going to be getting thinner and thinner because these projects are not coming online like they used to. The big discoveries aren't being made. The grades of the ones that are being that are being produced in gold, silver, and copper are declining. Uh, there are more uh, issues with uh, country risk. Uh, last week in Indonesia, one of the largest gold copper uh, projects in the world was almost taken over by the government. The Grassberg project had been producing for many years. They had about a, an, an 85 or 90 percent ownership, and now the government has told them you get 49 percent, so the government has become a majority owner. And these things don't augur very well for increased production. So when the next upsurge happens, which is in the way of building now, is, is people come in and they buy more gold and silver physically, uh, then that pipeline is going to be harder and harder to fill, 
and the price will rise, and the premiums will rise as well, too. Speaking of supply, that kind of leads me right into my next question. I wanted to get your thoughts on, on a very interesting tidbit that I read in one of your other recent articles for MoneyMetals.com, where you made the point that even with higher gold prices this year, the scrap or recycling of gold is actually down a pretty good percentage, which is very interesting because you would think that people would be more apt to sell their gold jewelry or whatever gold items they may have when the price is rising, but the data shows the opposite. So to, so to me, that either means that the gold has already been recycled and there is less of it out there for scrap, or because people realize that maybe I don't want to get rid of this stuff, or perhaps it's a combination of both. So what do you make of all that, David? I think you're right on the mark with that, and I don't have a solid statistical figure to prove uh, our view or my view. But I really believe, I think, first of all, I think a big factor is that the uh, supply pipeline uh, from the standpoint of precious metals from jewelry and whatnot uh, and recycling is, is becoming thinner and thinner. And there's just been so much of it sold into the market, there's not that much left anymore. And then, as you say, I think the sharper people that do have some of these things are saying, you know, wait a minute, this maybe I should hang on to this. And so those things are kind of coming together. And I... I really don't expect that uh, recycling will be, be a huge element going forward in trying to deal with the supply pipeline. I think it'll be uh, less and less of a factor uh, as we go forward. Yeah, maybe the weak hands, uh, so to speak, have already gotten rid of what they have, and now it's uh, left in, in mostly the hands of uh, more convicted folks. Uh, we've talked a lot about the PGMs, the Platinum Group Medals, with you before. We had Palladium hit nearly $1,000 earlier this week, and it's uh, now almost caught up with the Platinum price, something which is extremely unusual. You've been really bullish on Palladium for the last three to five years now, and you've really nailed it. Uh, but does Palladium have more room to run? Is it time to play the Platinum-Palladium ratio and favor Platinum here? Historically, that would be the case. When Palladium gets, quote, overvalued in relation to Platinum, that would be the way to go. I think things may be a little different this time. I'm not saying that there won't be a realignment in the relationship, but I think Palladium will continue to be strong on its own merits because so much of it is produced in Zimbabwe and Russia, and there isn't any indication that that uh, supply pipeline is going to be refilled anytime soon, and it is much rarer than platinum. still like palladium a lot better, and plat uh, platinum certainly has some room to move up, but how and when or if it will ever go back to its premium over gold is really difficult to say. I think, I think the relationship is really undergoing a fundamental change, and we'll find out all the reasons for that later, but it is something to kind of keep an eye on kind of revisiting that uh, Palladium conversation that we had, gosh, I guess it was two or three years ago, where you, you favored that as, as your number one precious metal at the time. And like I said, you've totally nailed it. And, and the advantage of having Palladium or, or any of these PGMs is really is kind of a portfolio diversifier. They're obviously driven by different fundamentals. Both Platinum and Palladium are primarily used in catalytic converters, and then there are other industrial applications. And there's a fair amount of jewelry, especially in the Far East, that is... Uh, made from platinum, so they both uh, go on those merits, and, you know, we hear a lot about the electrical cars and things like that, and those are coming along, and how that will affect the PGMs down the line, probably pretty substantially, but I think, I think palladium has got a pretty good run left in it before we have to start worrying too much about that situation. The U.S. Men is just now announcing uh, that they're going to be introducing a Palladium Eagle, uh, which uh, will be interesting. The first time that they're doing that, we'll see what kind of demand there is uh, for that item here later this year. Uh, how about the miners, David? They, they finally started to perk up in the last two weeks as gold f finally broke above uh, $1,300 again. But, but they've been in the doldrums for the last year after starting out 2016 with a huge move. I is it time to get into the mining stocks again? And if so, what kind of stocks would you suggest people look at? Well, the very fascinating to me change that's taking place, and this is, uh, it's like one of those things that's not 100% uh, percent confirmed yet, but I'd say it's about 90% confirmed. For up to 20 years, the relationship between gold and the mining stocks has been tilted in favor of gold. So in other words, for the last two decades, people that bought physical metal did better on a percentage basis with less risk than buying the mining stocks, but that is now starting to change. And it looks like the mining stocks are going to outperform the metal. They're both going to do very well, but they're going to, and, and they should outperform because there's much more risk. If someone comes to you and they buy 10 ounces of gold or 1,000 ounces of silver, the only risk they have from buying it to you after they hold it is the price of gold and silver. Is it going to go up or down? 
But if you buy a mining stock, you've got about dozens of risks. You've got uh, nationalization. You've got the cost of production. Are they going to run out of the ore that they thought they had? All sorts of things like this, the mine collapse. And, and so those things necessitate that anyone buying a mining stock has to accept greater risk. And the only reason that they'll accept more risk is if there's more reward. And so that has not been in their favor on a consistent basis over the last 20 years, although, as you mentioned last year, they did outperform. But now that's starting to change, and so there's a lot to be said for a person holding uh, physical metal as the insurance uh, part and as a, as a profit part, and also holding some very carefully selected mining stocks. I think both are going to do very well going forward over the next few years. Yeah, that's very well put, and uh, you illustrate that very well. And obviously, we've we've said for a long time that mining stocks are not a substitute for owning the physical metal, uh, but uh, it's more of a supplement to a uh, physical holding that you already have. Uh, let's change gears uh, here and talk for a minute about Bitcoin. You see lots of promise in Bitcoin. It has at least the potential to serve as another form of honest money, but it will need to clear some hurdles. One of the big ones we can see coming is regulation. Governments are increasingly aware of the threat posed by Bitcoin, both to the fiat currency monopolies they have been running and to their friends in the banking sector. What is your take on whether or not regulators will be able to succeed in controlling cryptocurrencies, David? Regulators are going to have a, a direct impact on that currency space, there's no doubt about it. But, you know, the blockchain is something that is kind of the genie that's out of the bottle. It's not going away. It's going to fundamentally transform a big chunk of financial exchange as we know it, because it's peer-to-peer -peer exchange. In other words, there's no middleman. So a point A to point B goes straight through on the blockchain. It's a public pronouncement of, of a transaction and this type of thing. So the blockchain itself is a fundamental uh, change that will be with us. Which of the cryptocurrencies will be around is another guess. Of course, right now, Bitcoin and Ethereum are a couple of the, of the biggest ones, and Ethereum is more of a tool than a currency itself. But uh, it was very interesting, you know, uh, when China cracked down last week on the uh, they outlawed uh, most of the ICOs that are being out there, the, in, the initial coin offerings, and some of them are just junk, and that's true in the United States as well, too. But when they when they kind of stopped that market dead in its tracks, Bitcoin dropped $1,000. Well, so now it's back up. It's gained 600 of that. So I think the, the cryptocurrencies are going to continue to be a significant factor because they, they deal with money transfer and preservation in a different way than the metals. But for anyone to, to go all in, on the on the uh, cryptocurrencies, I think is really uh, at this point is a very very risky move. Now, I trade uh, these myself as well, but you know I do the what I call an asymmetric trade, where I put a relatively small amount of money into a particular currency idea, and uh, if I lose it all, I've lost a little bit of money. And but at the same time, I might be up three or four or five times, and so this way, no one position knocks me out. But uh, there has been, I think, a comp competition in the last year between buying gold and silver and cryptocurrencies. And I think these big swings that we're seeing is causing people that are thinking about what they're doing to be more cautious and say, well, now, would I put my next X amount of money automatically into the cryptocurrencies or would I buy some more gold and silver? And I think from the standpoint of our discussion today, the value proposition in relation to risk and potential uh, improvement in, in which you buy really rests with the, with the gold and silver and uh, PGMs today uh, for the majority of the new money that you want to put into either investment or insurance. And sure, put some money into the cryptocurrencies if you understand them properly, but understand that the swings in them, if you think the swings in the mining stocks are profound, it's nothing compared to the cryptocurrencies. They can literally go from uh, zero overnight to an 800% the next day and then down 600% the day after that. So... They are just, they're the Wild West uh, on steroids. So um, I just would caution people, you know, to be conservative, that you should learn how these things operate and understand the blockchain, but don't think that you're going to just come up with your child's education here in the next six months and be able to hang on to it. Just be careful. Yeah, very good point. It it can be a little bit of a speculator's game, but obviously there's a lot of a lot of value in there, and uh, just the fact that we do have uh, some currency that's not controlled by governments, I guess, is a good thing at the end of the day. We've definitely upped our game when it comes to Bitcoin. We've accepted Bitcoin uh, for a long time now for purchases of metal, and, and soon we're going to be able to pay people in Bitcoin who want to sell their gold and silver back to us. Uh, well, finally, David, as we begin to wrap up here, uh, talk about some of the key support and resistance levels you're watching 
watching here in the metals as we progress towards the end of the year and into next year? Are we poised to take out some of the overhead resistance levels we've seen, especially when it comes to silver, or do we still have some work to do before we get too excited about a sustained up move? What are your thoughts there on the technicals as we begin to close? Well, the progressive levels of resistance, in other words, the levels of prior selling that kept prices from going higher for quite a while, they're being attacked pretty vigorously. But I think right now we've seen a pretty good run in, in both metals, especially gold, and they'll be back and filling going on, uh, probably staying above 1300 in gold, or if it drops below that, won't stay there very long. But these levels are going to be increasingly attacked as we go forward. 1375 is another uh, good-sized level in gold. 1400, 1450. And once you get above that round number of 1400 and moving up toward 1500, that's going to tell people more and more that, hey, this bull market is for real. It's not a flash in the pan. It's going to go up. In terms of silver, $20 is a psychological uh, point that needs to be uh, uh, bested at some point. Uh, and then 22 and 26. And once those levels are over, then it's, you know, people are really going to be piling in. And so, We've talked about this topic before, but I think it's important that people remember there's two types of risk when you have an investment or when you buy, uh, you know, for any reason. One is information risk, and the other is price risk. So if you buy something that is, quote, low uh, in price uh, or perceived to be low in price, uh, what you have there is low price risk in relationship to what's going on because we don't have a lot of information as to why the price is at that level. And so when you wait for prices to rise substantially, then more is known about why those prices are going up. And at some point, you have lower information risk uh, and you have higher price risk. So there's no getting around it. You're going to pay for it one way or the other, either accept the information risk or accept the price risk or ideally accept something in the middle. So if people want to wait until silver is $26 an ounce and that will prove that our thesis is correct, that's fine. But they'll pay 26 actually they'll pay, what, 27 or 27.50 an ounce, or maybe 28 for that metal, whereas now they can pick it up because the price risk is lower and the information risk is, is, is higher. Uh, they'll pick it up for, what, $18. So, it's, you know, you just decide what you're going to do, but be aware of why you're doing, why you're making that decision so that you understand intellectually what you've done and why you're doing it. Yeah, at the end of the day, none of the reasons that uh... – that made gold and silver worth owning five, six years ago, out of control government debt, uh, fiat currencies being printed all over the world. Uh, none of those things have changed at all. The fundamentals are still there, and the rationale for why you want to have some financial insurance is uh, very much alive today. Well, David, uh, thanks so much for your time today and for enlightening us with your wonderful insights once again. Continued success with the book, Second Chance, How to Make and Keep Big Money During the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave, and we definitely urge everyone to check that out if you haven't already david smith and david morgan do a great job there and i uh, look forward to catching up with you again uh, before long and i hope you have a great weekend thanks david you too mike people uh, when they look at this book they're going to find out how to hang on to most of what they make as well too which nobody really deals with that very effectively so it's a, it's one thing to make it and it's another to keep it and i think the philosophy that you guys have at money metals because you do provide a two-way market where you don't just sell, you actually buy back as well, too. So when the time comes that people want to sell some of their metals uh, for a good profit, uh, you'll be there for them, unlike some other entities that uh, maybe, maybe won't be still standing because of their business practices. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to David Smith, Senior Analyst at the Morgan Report and regular columnist for MoneyMetals.com and co-author, along with David Morgan, of the book Second Chance, How to Make and Keep Big Money During the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave, which is available at MoneyMetals.com and Amazon. Pick up a copy today. And check back here next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions, or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. 
Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865. 